Institute of International Affairs. And it really gives me great pleasure uh, to be um, moderating and opening this first in a series of three um, sessions uh, as part of the uh, as of our part of our project together with the uh, Embassy of China here in South Africa on China Africa Joint Research and Exchange Program, which uh, is an initiative uh, of some of some years standing now of the Forum on China Africa uh, cooperation. Before I even uh, go any further in in that discussion, I really want to uh, uh, give a warm uh, welcome to the new uh, uh, Ambassador of the People's Republic of China to, uh, to South Africa, uh, Ambassador Chen Shaodong. It's really a great pleasure to meet you. Uh, I hope soon that I will be able to meet you personally <laughs> across a table or across a room. Uh, but uh, really very good to have you and, and really uh, uh, quite pleased that this is one of the first uh, uh, events that you are uh, participating in uh, since you uh, came to South Africa and, and assumed the position uh, earlier this, uh, this month. So really, uh, really welcome. So um, I'm sure you will find our country stimulating, interesting uh, and probably very loud, um, but uh, um, uh, welcome. Uh, also, uh, uh, a very big um, welcome and thank you uh, to our uh, distinguished uh, set of uh, panelists that I will be introducing uh, to you in, 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 a, in a short while. Uh, so thank you all very much for, for making the time. Um, as I said uh, right at the beginning, this is a, a, a three-session uh, dialogue, uh, an exchange. Uh, focusing on new dimensions of growth and development in Africa and China, looking at trade, infrastructure, and the fourth industrial revolution. This uh, session today, the first one, uh, will focus specifically on, uh, on economic cooperation and trade uh, in the context, of course, of what I think is a, a singularly important uh, development in, in Africa's uh, economic trajectory, if we get it right, which is the African continental free trade area. I think at a time when um, many parts of the world are turning inwards, uh, Africa has really embraced this very ambitious uh, continental program, recognizing that without uh, encouraging uh, this kind of integration through trade, through regional value chains, diversification, uh, many of the objectives of, uh, of, of development that we have on the continent and Agenda 2063 uh, will, not be, uh, will not be realized. So that's the topic this, this morning. And then uh, uh, on the 15th, I think uh, we have, uh, we focus on different dimensions of infrastructure development and financing. Uh, and then later on, uh, uh, the harnessing, harnessing the fourth industrial revolution uh, for economic development. These are all interrelated. In another time, we would probably have had them one after the other on the same day as a proper conference. Uh, but uh, um, this is how um, uh, things, uh, things go. I'll, I'll make some additional remarks as we move into the discussion with the panelists. But uh, now let me uh, uh, introduce to you uh, the, uh, the ambassador who will be giving uh, the keynote address. Uh, ambassador Chen, as I indicated, uh, uh, took up his position here as ambassador uh, of the People's Republic of China uh, uh, from October 2020. Uh, he has, long, has had a long uh, career in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, joining it in 1988. And uh, in that, uh, in the ensuing period has served in various positions, uh, uh, obviously in, within the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in China, but also uh, in postings in Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, uh, and Iraq. Very much a Middle Eastern uh, ex expert um, ambassador, uh, and before his posting here to to South Africa, he served as Assistant Minister of Foreign Affairs between 2017 and 2020, and immediately before that um, was Ambassador uh, of uh, China to the Republic of Singapore. Uh, ambassador, again, uh, welcome, welcome to South Africa, welcome to this uh, to this webinar. We're very pleased to be doing it together with the um, with the embassy, and look forward to your um, to your uh, address. Okay.
Honorable Mrs. Uh, Sidi Ruponas, Chief Executive of the South Africa Institute of International Affairs, uh, distinguished representatives from think tanks, media, and the business community, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good morning. First, I want to thank for Mrs. Sidirupoulos, very warm words and a good introduction for myself. I really it's my uh, great honor to serve as a new Chinese ambassador to South Africa. Uh, I'm also looking forward to meet with all friends from South Africa from Africa in the future. So today is my great honor to attend the webinar on new dimensions of China-Africa development, trade, infrastructure, and the fourth industrial revolution hosted by SAYA. Of course, this is my first time Since I assume the post, the Chinese ambassador to South Africa to attend the, uh, 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 this uh, uh, webinar. Here, I would like to extend my sincere greetings to all friends who have cared about and support the growth of China, South Africa, and China Africa relations. My colleagues told me that the SAYA has been rated as the best think tank in Sub-Sahara Africa for many years in a row. With strong research capability, SAYA has set up a special China study group, which has played a positive role in promoting exchanges between China and Africa. Mrs. Sidi Rupunas, the chief executive of SAYA, has made positive contributions to enhancing China, South Africa, and China Africa exchanges and the friendship. As a project sponsored by the China Africa Joint Research and Exchange Program, this webinar once again demonstrates the close cooperation between our two sides. The webinar on new dimensions of China-Africa development, trade infrastructure, and the fourth industrial revolution in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic addressed timely the core interest and the major concern of China-Africa cooperation. This webinar brings the think tanks, scholars, media representatives, and the business elites from both China and Africa together. It serves as a platform for brainstorming, dialogue, and offering insights for China-Africa cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, before assuming the post, I was an assistant foreign minister covering Africa affairs. I saw for myself the fast and all round progress of China, South Africa and China, Africa relations. Now China, Africa comprehensive strategic partnership has entered a new era for win-win cooperation and the common development. Our two sides are working together for a closer China-Africa community with a shared future. China-Africa mutual and beneficial cooperation has entered a new stage of transformation and upgrading, defined by a shift from government-led assistance to market driving trade and enterprise investment. From general merchandise trade 
to production capacity cooperation and processing trade, and from project contracting to investment, construction, operation, and financial cooperation. Trade and investment are brilliant achievement of China-Africa cooperation. China remains Africa's largest trading partner for 11 consecutive years. Two-way trade between China and Africa reached 208.7 billion US dollars in 2019. 20 times that of the year of 2000. China remains South Africa's largest trading partner for 11 years in a row, and South Africa has become China's largest trading partner in Africa for 10 consecutive years, with two-way trade reached 42.46 billion US billion US dollar in 2019. South Africa is also the first Africa countries to explore, to export beef to China. And China has become the largest consuming market for South Africa's beef. At the China International Fair and for trade, in services held in earlier September this year, the tourism products from Angola, Botswana, and Rwanda attract attention for many Chinese tourists. China now is opening wider to the outside world, while the Africa continental free trade area covering a market of 1.2 billion people and a combined gross domestic products of more than 3.4 trillion US dollars enjoys huge potential for development. Against such background, China-Africa trade enjoys broad prospects. China will continue to support Africa Free Trade Zone carry out free trade agreement negotiations with Africa countries that are willing to cooperate with China and increase imports of Africa products, especially non-resource goods. More than 200 enterprises from over 40 Africa countries showcase their products at the first and the second China International Export, Import Export. The third China International Import Expo will be held from November 5th to 10th. We look forward to more products and enterprises from Africa countries at the upcoming CIIE so as to bring more confidence to China-Africa trade and support Africa's economic recovery after the pandemic. In recent years, China's investment in Africa has increased steadily as well. Up to now, China's direct investment stock in Africa stands at 110 billion US dollars. There are over 3,700 Chinese, Chinese companies investing and doing business in Africa. According to rough statistics, China's total investment in South Africa has exceeded 25 billion US dollars, creating more than 400,000 local jobs. Going forward, China will step up investment and cooperation with Africa in infrastructure, special economic zone, and industrial parks, equipment manufacturing, industrial capacity, energy, and resources development, as well as financing cooperation. 
so as to help Africa countries better integrate into global value and industrial chain, chains. Infrastructure remain as a strong cornerstone of China-Africa cooperation. Inadequate infrastructure is a major development bottleneck for Africa countries. Africa's average investment gap for infrastructure among to 100 billion US dollar every year. China has become the largest financial and the contractor of Africa's infrastructure. Infrastructure. Over the years, China has helped build in Africa over 10,000 kilometers of road, 6,000 kilometers of railway, more than 150 stadiums, conference centers, and parliament buildings more than 200 schools and eight power plants or power stations, as well as many airports, ports, and ports benefiting, benefiting almost all Africa countries. Jointly advancing the Belt and Road Initiative has injected strong new momentum into China-Africa infrastructure cooperation. So far, 44 African countries and the African Union have signed BRI cooperation documents with China. China's infrastructure projects have created revenues of over 50 billion US dollars a year for African countries. The Mombasa Nairobi Railway has created nearly 50,000 jobs for the local people, driving Kenya's economic growth by about 1.5% and making outstanding contribution to local economic and social development. Going forward, China is ready to work with Africa to formulate and implement the China-Africa Infrastructure Cooperation Plan support Africa countries in making better use of such financial channels as the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB, the New Development Bank, and the Silk Road Fund, and support Chinese enterprises in participating in Africa's infrastructure development through investment, construction, operation, and other models. We will focus on strengthening cooperation in energy, transportation, information, and communication technologies, and transboundary water resources. China and Africa will join hand to implement a number of key interconnectivity projects will support the implementation of the single Africa air transportation market. The fourth industrial revolution is a brand new opportunity for China-Africa cooperation. In recent years, the fourth industrial revolution represented by artificial intelligence, big data, and the internet of things are unfolding and growing rapidly around the world. Africa is seizing the opportunity brought by the fourth industrial revolution. South Africa, Egypt, Nigeria, and other African countries have incorporated the digital economy into their national development strategy. South Africa has established the fourth industrial revolution presidential Com committee chaired by President Ramaphosa. In the first quarter of this year, the number of registered users of mobile wallets in Nigeria payment company, Paga, increased by 3.3 times compared with the previous quarter.
South Africa Tele Telecommunication Company, MTN, achieved rapid growth in its business in Africa market. China-Africa cooperation in the digital economy has achieved gratifying results. 80% of Africa backbone network infrastructure is built by Huawei and ZTE. ZTE's products has served and services have been distributed in 48 African countries. Alipay's mobile payment business has involved more than 10,000 merchants in South Africa. Huawei and Rain, a local mobile data network operator in South Africa, have released the first 5G commercial network in South Africa and built more than 1,000 base stations. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Chinese company used various digital corporate cooperation platforms to help the export of Africa specialty products to China through online promotion commercial conference and live broadcast. Alibaba Group Electronic World Trade Platform has enabled products from Ethiopia, Rwanda, and other African countries to have direct access to Chinese consumers through cross-border e-commerce platform. In May of this year, 3,000 bags of Gorilla Coffee of Rwanda were sold out in one second in the Taobao live broadcast. As part of the move, to address the emerging challenge. The Chinese side proposed a global initiative on data security, an initiative that calls for upholding the principle of multilateralism, balanced security and development, and ensuring fairness and justice so as to safeguard global data security. China firmly opposed that certain countries resorted to unjustifiable bashing and uh, malicious slander under the false pretext of ensuring data security and opposed to the all round sanctions on Huawei with the ex excuse of the so called national security or even force other countries to giving up the cooperation with Huawei. Such behavior will save global supply and industrial chains and have severe impl implications on the global market by undermining the principle of fair competition and disrupting market order it will surely face the cooperation of, uh, it will surely face the op opposition from the other countries including the africa countries the fourth industrial revolution has created tremendous opportunities and a vast space for china africa cooperation china is willing to work with africa to expand cooperation in new infrastructure building, such as 5, 5G, big data centers, artificial intelligence, ultra high voltage power transmissions, and in new business forms, such as digital economy, smart cities, clean energy, and e-commerce. Our two sides should conduct in-depth joint research, technical personnel training, and combat COVID-19 with sincere, sorry, combat COVID-19 with science and technology 
so as to jointly building a digital Silk Road that benefits the people livelihood through win-win cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> dear friends, this year marks the 20th year anniversary of FOCAC. Yesterday, President Xi Jinping and Senegal President Marcus Sala exchanged congratulatory message on the 20th anniversary of the FOCAC. 20 years since its establishment, FOCAC has traveled an extra, extraordinary journey thanks to the joint efforts of China and Africa. It has become an important and vibrant platform for collective dialogue and effective mechanism for practical cooperation between China and Africa and an important front for source-source cooperation. China and Africa will take the 20th anniversary of FOCAC as an opportunity to elevate the China-Africa Comprehensive Strategic Cooperative Partnership to a higher level, build and close China-Africa community with a shared future, deliver more benefits to the Africa peoples, make the China-Africa cooperation an example of multilateralism and win-win cooperation and uh, contribute more to defending fairness and justice on the world stage and promoting global development and prosperity. President Xi Jinping and President Ramaphosa also co-host the extraordinary China-Africa Summit on solidarity against COVID-19 to explore ways for the growth of China, South Africa and China-Africa relations. The South Africa government and the enterprises support China's COVID-19 response. The Chinese government and the people from all works of life have donated millions of rands, more than six million masks, hundreds of thousands of testing keys, ventilators, protective suits, and other anti-pandemic supplies to South Africa. At the extraordinary China-Africa Summit on Solidarity Against COVID-19, President Xi Jinping proposed that China will continue to do whatever it can to support Africa's COVID-19 response. China will continue to help Africa countries by providing supply and sending expert teams. China will start ahead of schedule. The construction of Africa CDC headquarters this year we pledge that once the development and the deployment of COVID-19 vaccine is complete in China, Africa countries will be among the first to benefit. Now China is stepping up vaccine cooperation with Morocco, Egypt, and the many African countries. China has announced to join COVAX with the purpose to ensure equitable distribution of vaccine, especially to developing countries and hope more capable countries will also join and support COVAX. China also attach great importance to date stability and Africa of Africa and the economic and social returns of projects, putting ourselves in Africa's position. We have worked to help Africa 
prevent debt risks and alleviate repayment pressure. China have been, has been committed to efficient and high quality development in Africa in a way that respects the will of the African people and in line with the actual needs. COVID-19 is putting greater economic pressure on Africa countries. China takes the situation seriously and has made active efforts to meet African needs. On the basis of implement, imp, implementing the G20 State Service Suspicion Initiative, and within the FOCAC framework, China has declared to cancel the date of relevant African countries in the form of interest-free government loans that are due to mature by the end of 2020. China also calls on multilateral financial institutions and private creditors to increase support for African countries that are seriously affected by the pandemic, including state restructuring and further extension of the debt relief period. At present, the Export-Import Bank of China as an official bilateral creditor has signed date susp suspension agreement with 11 African countries. Other non-official creditors have also reached consensus on debt relief with some African countries with reference to the DSSI. China will also waive interest-free loan due to mature by the end of 2020 for 15 African countries. Those policy measures will help African countries expand physical resources, restore economic operation, better allocate resources and address the impact of COVID-19. Facing COVID-19 is of vital importance to maintain Africa's momentum of development over the years. China will act more forcefully to support Africa countries in pursuing economic self-reliance and sustainable development and tackling the root cause of that issue. China-Africa friendship and cooperation has emerged stronger from challenges and difficulties. However, certain force with ulterior motives have kept fabricating the so-called date trap fallacy, strategic asset plundering fallacy, new colonialism fallacy to exert pressure on African countries and prevent their cooperation with China in 5G and other fields. This attempt to drive a wage between China and Africa and force Africa to take size. All of their acts are attributed to Cold War mentality and the zero-sum game mindset. They run counter to the trend of the times and are doomed to fail. We are glad to see that during the 75th session of the UN General Assembly, the vast number of African countries represented by South Africa and Serbia serve as a staunch force in upholding multilateralism. In the context of profound changes in the international situation, 
and the COVID-19 pandemic unseen in a century is more imperative than ever for China and South Africa, China and Africa to strengthen solidarity and cooperation. China and Africa must stay committed to the path of multilateralism, jointly safeguard the UN-centered international system and the WTO-centered multilateralism trading system and take a clear cast stand against unilateralism, protectionism, racism, and bullying. China has become the first country to bring COVID-19 under effective control and restore economic growth. We are now fostering a new economic dynamic with free-flowing domestic circulation as a mainstay and mutually reinforced by international circulation. Good results have been delivered in South Africa and Africa COVID-19 response. The African countries are now promoting economic recovery. In light of the post-COVID-19 situation, China is ready to work with Africa to grasp the new dimensions of development and identify the areas for our cooperation, thus ushering a new stage of China-Africa cooperation. I wish this seminar a complete success. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I think it's been a it's a it's been a very comprehensive uh, setting out both of the uh, of some of the statistics uh, that have uh, that govern the economic uh, relationship both with South Africa and Africa, and indeed some of the more burning questions uh, that have emerged uh, in 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 the wake of uh, of COVID nineteen. Uh, so thank you very much. I hope that uh, we will be able to. Um, to get a copy of the speech that we can actually put onto the website. I think that it was so rich in information that I was trying to take everything down and I think <laughs> I missed stuff. So I'm hoping that uh, I'll be able to uh, uh, to uh, to look at it uh, after this uh, presentation. Uh, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Okay, thank now you very much. Um, shall we move on then to um, our panel discussion? Uh, which is broken up into uh, into a set of three presentations together then with uh, uh, followed by uh, by comments the focus is specifically uh, indeed on some of the issues that the uh, that the ambassador has highlighted to, towards the beginning of his speech around trade around the importance of the African continental free trade area uh, investment uh, and and diversification um, I think maybe before we start and, and move on to that, I, I think it's, it's important to just reflect a little bit on, on what the pandemic has, uh, has actually cost Africa. I think on the whole, um, uh, why it, well, in the first instance, I think it's brought the world, the capitalist world to a halt. And I don't think anybody could have imagined that this, this is something that the pandemic could have done. And while in the African context, um, I think we, we, we were spared many of the apocalyptic uh, uh, projections about uh, how it might affect uh, the health of, of, of people. It certainly, from an economic dimension, uh, has, been, uh, has been quite uh, uh, difficult. And I think it will become more difficult uh, uh, over the course of, of the next few months as the full effects um, are felt. Um, I think it, it it's going to affect uh, uh, the so many of the development gains we have made over the last uh, couple of decades. There's already st uh, figures on how it will impact on poverty, the ability of countries to create social safety nets for the population, uh, uh, the difficulty of, 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 of really using and, and having public investment that is necessary for the recovery, certainly not on the scale. African countries don't have those kinds of resources on the scale that we have seen in, in certainly in the industrialized world. Um, there was, a, there was a, a forecast done by a colleague from, uh, from the Institute for Security Studies recently, Yaki Saliers, who uh, projected uh, forecast that by 2030, 
we would probably have as a result of the pandemic um, uh, an additional 38 to 70 million uh, more people uh, who would be classified as extremely poor. And then, of course, as the ambassador spoke uh, spoke about uh, the issue of the challenge of debt sustainability, which has become uh, much more acute uh, in, in the wake of the pandemic. Uh, and in that context, we see the vision of an African continental uh, free trade area that was really intended to accelerate Africa's growth trajectory and promote economic diversification. And COVID has delayed what we were supposed to, uh, to have kicked off in, in, in June or July of, uh, of this year, but we really need to be able to pick that up quickly and work together with our international partners in, 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 uh, in taking this forward. Um, the other big elephant in the room, and this is going to be part of the discussion in the presentation this morning, is of course uh, climate change uh, and the need um, to, to, for all our economies uh, to move on to a more sustainable path. And paradoxically, uh, COVID provides this opportunity uh, with the mobilization of huge funds, whether they are through directly through the public or through other sources uh, to, to, combat, um, uh, to combat the pandemic. And I think we need to think cleverly uh, about how we can use this, this crisis uh, as a way of, of, of repurposing uh, our economies. I've already mentioned regional value chains. This is obviously one of an important dimension of the continental free trade area. It, it, it helps to spur diversification uh, as well as become engines of, of regional integration. Uh, and this is where I think uh, partnerships uh, with key external investors like China can help to spur that, both in terms of creating local jobs, uh, but also creating and contributing to creating uh, uh, additional uh, components in the value chain that are African owned and, and uh, businesses that then interact both with international companies as well as with, with value chains uh, that, are, that, are, that are more domestic uh, and local and, and, and regional. Um, and so that from, a, from an African perspective is also we need to think about what are the right kinds of policy interventions uh, that can help to spur that kind of uh, local uh, foreign uh, uh, business cooperation in terms of uh, building up regional value chains. And I think those are, those are some of the issues that each individual African country uh, will have to apply their minds on as we roll out the African continental uh, free trade area. These are just some of the issues issues uh, against which this discussion will play out uh, today. Um, the first presentation uh, by Palesa Shipalana, uh, who is the uh, head of, uh, of SIA's uh, economic diplomacy program, uh, will be focusing on, on green finance. Uh, the second one uh, will uh, by, by Dr. Vaso Nzenze from University of Johannesburg, and I'll do a proper introduction now, uh, we'll look at um, uh, at agricultural, <clears throat> I'm sorry, at agricultural exports. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and then uh, the, the third one, uh, which uh, will look at manufacturing and Africa's Chinese manufacturing and Africa's industrialization, looking specifically at manufacturing investment in Ethiopia is uh, YY Chen. Uh, we then move on to two panelists uh, uh, who will be commenting on this, and that's Dr. Lauren Johnston, uh, who is from uh, the SOAS China Institute and Kwame Owino at the Institute of Economic Affairs, <clears throat> sorry, uh, <clears throat> in Kenya. Let me just briefly then reflect a little bit on each of their CVs and then we'll kick off. Uh, as I said, uh, Palesa uh, heads up our economic diplomacy program. Uh, she focuses on public finance, regional integration and South African economic and policy developments. Uh, previously, she worked as an economist in the public sector for about nine years, that focusing on, on public finance management, public entities, oversight management, uh, and various policy reform programs in the pensions and medical scheme sector. Um, 
She's also worked on the South African social sector reform uh, program at UNICEF and uh, was at the stock exchange, Johannesburg Stock Exchange, looking at the regional integration of capital markets. Dr. Basun Zenze, who is the research director at the Center for Africa-China Studies uh, here at the University of Johannesburg. He's a senior lecturer on technology dynamics, international law and Africa-China relations in also in the politics department at that university. And he's worked extensively on, <clears throat> on the relationship between Africa um, and China on emerging technologies and international relations, uh, international political economy of inter interstate war in the late 20th century uh, in East Africa. Uh, and he is, is widely published in, in media and, and journals. Then um, uh, Dr. Wai, Wai Chen, <clears throat> uh, as I indicated, uh, is at uh, the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Her PhD focuses on the dynamics of Chinese private o uh, overseas foreign direct investment in Ethiopia, and that's what uh, she'll be talking about uh, this morning. Uh, she's also worked as a research assistant uh, for the principal investigator, Professor Carlos Oya, in an, a four-year uh, collaborative research project that looked at Chinese firms and employment dynamics in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, she has also then done work on the ground. Uh, she's been affiliated with the Ethiopian Investment Commission as the Chinese investment advisor for a year in 2017-2018. Uh, has uh, was also the national research consultant of the International Trade Center uh, for the Partnership for Investment and Growth in Africa and the Pacific. Uh, this was a project uh, that was during her field work in, in Ethiopia. Um, then uh, Dr. Lauren Johnston, uh, uh, also a research associate at SOAS China Institute uh, uh, and also a research fellow at the Faculty of Social Sciences at Mohammed Sank uh, University in, in Rabat. Uh, she's widely published in English and Chinese on China-Africa economic relations and economic demography topics. Uh, she has previously held positions at the Mercato Institute for China Studies based in Berlin, at the University of Melbourne, the Beijing Foreign Studies University, and uh, also worked at the World Economic uh, Forum in Geneva. She was an Overseas Development Institute Fellow and Economist for a year in each of the ministries of uh, finance of Sierra Leone and Guyana, and a founding director of uh, New South Economics. Uh, where she consulted to, uh, to the World Bank and the United Nations. And she holds a PhD in international economics from Peking University and an MSc development from uh, in econ development economics from uh, SOAS. Uh, then finally, and then we'll kick off with the discussion, um, Kwame Owino is the Chief Executive Officer uh, of the Institute of Economic Affairs, which is uh, based in, in, in Kenya. Uh, uh, he has uh, risen through the ranks at IEA uh, uh, Kenya and led research and policy dialogue and economic regulation and competition policy during that period. Uh, his interests include economic regulation, employment economics and, and public sector reform. And he undertakes and oversees research in the IEA as Kenya's key policy areas, which are public expenditure and revenue analysis, international trade, economic regulation, devolution, and the use of futures methodologies to inform uh, public affairs um, in, in Kenya. Right, uh, rather long introduction, I apologize for that. Um, but shall we then uh, kick off uh, with our first panelists, uh, presenters, who uh, is uh, Palesa Shipalana from uh, SIA. Over to you, Palesa. Alessa, do you want to unmute yourself and uh, put your video on if possible? Uh, morning, everyone. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, can someone allow me to share my screen, please? You should be able to. Um, you just press the it's share screen. Disabled. And is it dis oh, the share disabled? button is disabled. Sarasa, please help. Okay, there we go. Okay. Sarasa, will you put it on uh, presentation mode? Great, thanks. Okay, you over to you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, um, 
My presentation is on uh, green finance mechanisms uh, for developing countries, just looking at uh, uh, emerging practices. Um, I'll start off with a brief introduction. Uh, start also keep the slide on the oh, 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 where it is now. I'll tell you to move it, please. Thanks. Um, the relevance of green finance has risen in the last few uh, months, uh, but COVID-19 in the last few years actually, but COVID-19 drove the green finance uh, discussion uh, or discourse. Uh, to prominent levels, uh, making it a central theme that underpins a uh, new sustainable economic development and recovery strategies and policies for post-pandemic. Um, just to share a, quick, a few quick uh, statistics on how the impact of COVID-19 has devastated Africa, uh, which is now facing at least $500 billion in economic costs in 2020 alone due to the coronavirus and uh, the continent hosts seven of the world's most, uh, uh, the world's 10 most climate vulnerable nations. And uh, lastly, in 2020 alone, the continent has interest payments for its debt amounts to 400 billion US dollars, uh, indicating that it definitely does lack uh, the financial capacity to mobilize green uh, stimulus packages uh, and therefore it needs help. Um, so, um, the continent is definitely facing a twin crisis, COVID-19 and a climate crisis. And if uh, the continent can successfully uh, build back better using the mechanisms that I'm going to uh, present uh, now, uh, then uh, it will be able to achieve a triple dividend uh, of reducing the pandemic risk while at the same time increasing climate resilience and strengthening economic recovery. Uh, as the first slide, please, Sarasa. Sarasa, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the first instrument that I looked at is uh, greening the financial sector. It's, um, um, it goes without saying that central bank regulatory intervention can ensure that uh, financial institutions provide a technically sound justification for the activities and investments considered green. Um, because environmental risks are not taken into account in Basel III, which provides the main regulatory guidelines for global banking um, uh, systems. Um, Central banks in the developing context have an important role to play uh, in green financial systems, um, uh, especially because on the continent, environmental regulation is weakly implemented uh, by weak, somewhat weak public uh, institutions that lack clout. Uh, therefore, uh, in developing countries, central banks are, play, uh, are seen as powerful and sophisticated institutions overseeing the dominant banking sector within the financial system. Um, there, there are a few mechanisms that have been recommended with caution, however, I must say, uh, 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 that, uh, that uh, present potential tools that central banks can use to impact investment decisions and create and allocate credit into green investments and direct credit away from um, environmentally harmful uh, activities. I just realized now that I forgot to share my video. Cyril told me to start to share my video when I started speaking. Um, okay. I hope it's working. Um, the first uh, uh, potential tool that can be used by central banks to drive uh, green investments in the financial sector, to green the financial sector is to introduce green uh, macro prudential regulation and climate related stress testing uh, to address environmental systematic risks. Um, an example of macro prudential instruments includes higher risk weights for either carbon intensive and dependent uh, sectors, such as your transport, uh, mining and energy sectors. And then the second uh, tool that can be used is to direct green credit uh, policy instruments, such as uh, using differentiated um, re-discount rates uh, that can be used to incentivize uh, commercial banks to extend credit to green investments 
using discounted bills and lower loans uh, rates. Um, and uh, the second uh, uh, tool that can be used is to uh, is green differentiated reserve requirement that can allow uh, 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 that will allow central banks to lower required reserve rates uh, on privileged green assets, thereby uh, ensuring that the financial system favors a uh, green investments over traditional investment. And then the fourth one is. Um, uh, differentiated capital requirements uh, for low carbon activities or green projects. Uh, uh, this can be done the same way uh, SMMEs are getting uh, uh, loans uh, under Basel III, favorable loan terms under Basel III. Um, the fifth one is uh, the development of green finance guidelines and frameworks aimed at guiding banks towards greener lending. And I say banks only, I specify banks only because they they, they dominated the financial sector in, in, in the continent. And uh, lastly, uh, just to mention that uh, on this discussion, the Financial Stability Board at the international level has recommended that um, uh, central banks must, uh, 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 must have mandatory disclosure requirements for all financial organizations in their public financial filing in order to improve transparency of climate-related um, uh, risks which will provide the basis for green macroprudential regulation and climate-related stress testing. And Sarasa, please move on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, um, the second uh, green finance mechanism that was considered is uh, the development of green segments in stock markets in Africa. Um, just an introductory remark about a, a global, the global green bond market. It has uh, risen from around 155.5 billion US dollars worth of issues in 2017 to an estimated 250 to 200 billion uh, US dollars in 2018 alone, showing that there is uh, investors are seeing value in this market and they are is showing a keen interest in participating in this market. Um, so issuing green bonds can remove, uh, can, can, can become an important financial uh, mechanism to support a uh, green economic recovery because they are, the bonds are aligned with uh, the objective of keeping the climate risk and also uh, and, uh, uh, further, they can also further boost uh, strugg struggling domestic economies in Africa through investment in renewable energy um, as a market. Um, uh, green bonds have overall uh, the potential uh, for growth with investors keen on containing global warming. Uh, but we have to be mindful that since the advent of COVID-19, um, uh, there have been several credit, sovereign credit down ratings in, in, in Africa, and usually investors shy away from markets that have negative credit ratings. So in order to, uh, to participate for sovereign, uh, for, for, for sovereign governments in Africa to participate in the green bonds market, they have to ensure that they keep a positive uh, credit rating um, uh, to attract a, 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 a meaningful investment. Um, also, uh, green bonds, they tend to be oversubscribed and also they, uh, they have tax advantages um, and they make they just basically a good option for countries that had uh, to approach financial institutions like the IMF for funding to mitigate the cost effects of COVID-19. So it's therefore very important for first-time African sovereign, uh, sovereign green bond issuers to first develop a green frameworks uh, legislation to encourage green finance within their jurisdiction. And this will also promote a transparency and signal a commitment to green finance to global markets. Um, I just want to quickly share a few developments in Africa that uh, make the continent a, 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 prime, a prime candidate for funding uh, through sovereign green bonds. Uh, for example, um, in Morocco, uh, uh, Morocco is one of the countries spearheading the development of green bond market in Africa. And the regulatory infrastructure to support it, it has uh, it's put that in place. 
Kenya has uh, cross-listed its first green bond at the London Stock Exchange in January 2020. South Africa is considered to be a leader in municipal bond uh, 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 in the municipal bond market. And the Johannesburg uh, Stock Exchange signaled to the market a few months ago that it will be uh, upgrading its green bond segment uh, into a full sustainability segment, which will include social bond principles and sustainability guidelines. And at the back of that, Net Bank in South Africa uh, was the first uh, issued the first ever renewable uh, energy green bond. Um, uh, on, the, on the on the green segment at the JSE, and it was oversubscribed three times over. Um, so that's the next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Um, the other uh, green finance mechanism that was considered in the study was uh, green or environmental funds. Um, as we know, climate finance has led to a broadening of scope and mandate for environmental funds uh, that are already existing, which have also become vital financing mechanisms for the implementation of national environmental action plans and green programs in the domestic uh, economies. Uh, some of the key success factors for environmental funds uh, um, for developing countries should be the following uh, 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 elements. Having a strong government commitment to ensuring that they are used only for providing funding and technical expertise, uh, building capacity in the domestic economy, supporting the transition of a green economy overall. And then secondly, they must have a strong governance system with representation from a diverse sector like NGOs and lobbying groups and private sector. And then thirdly, they must have long-term financial commitment and a strong and legal, uh, a strong legal and financial practices. Um, uh, environmental funds should also aim to have diverse revenue streams in the long term, and not just depend on the initial uh, uh, government funding that is used uh, to to establish it. And that uh, it's important for the government funding to be used to capitalize the EF in the beginning, but also to act as a stimulus to crowd in private sector and donor investment. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the other uh, green finance mechanism um, um, uh, that is suitable for developing countries is uh, market-based mechanisms uh, that are used to unlock green finance. Um, it's important to attract the private sector. Uh, investments for climate resilience programs. Uh, 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 and in order for that to happen, governments must improve the policy and regulatory environment and also create a market-based mechanisms to incentivize the private sector to come on board. So there has to be de-risking uh, that can be done by providing long-term grants. Uh, there has to be public capital used uh, uh, to provide credit enhancements, uh, either by government-owned public uh, 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 development finance institutions operating that uh, domestic market. There has to be co-investments by the private sector for large uh, projects, and also there has to be uh, the market has to create umbrella facilities for local financial institutions. Um, African countries are starting to experiment with innovative financing approaches. Um, um, and this uh, includes the creation of green and ethical banks that are, have been an interesting development in, finance, in sustainable, sustainable finance. An ethical bank is uh, a financial institutions that are governed by ethical principles and only, they only invest ethically and sustainably. These banks only offer ethical investments developed by ethical borrowers uh, in order to attract ethical investments. Um, and uh, uh, the key here is that they, they, they allow greater mobilization of local currency funding for sustainable investments. Um, so it's important to use your local currency to guard against uh, market volatility. Um, and then green banks, uh, they usually defined as public uh, financial institutions that are dedicated to green investments. And they also they they generally aim to fill a local market's climate investment shortfall. 
So green banks will have to compete with the local development banks in Africa as they are the ones that have been uh, trying to take up the green finance space. And uh, uh, this keen exploration of green and ethical banks in Africa has been seen in three particular countries, Morocco, South Africa, and, uh, and, and Malaysia. Um, so we must keep a close watch on that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, green, fin uh, green fiscal reform um, is an umbrella term used uh, for environmental fiscal, fiscal reform instruments, uh, but these instruments, uh, uh, their suitability differs uh, per country and per sector. Um, and then uh, um, green fiscal policy instruments uh, such as carbon tax and fossil fuel subsidies can help to generate and uh, reallocate uh, significant resources for economic recovery measures by incentivizing uh, greener solutions in the market and uh, energy efficiency recovery plans. Um, on the other hand, the removal of harmful subsidies uh, is also a financing mechanism employed to achieve certain SDGs. Um, I want to give an example of uh, this reverse side of green fiscal reform. Um, you, Egypt uh, apparently has uh, managed to... Um, to implement, uh, to use the World Bank's energy sector management assistance program uh, uh, to remove harmful subsidies in their market. And it achieved uh, uh, the fiscal cost of subs uh, subsidies was halved uh, to bring average electricity tariffs closer to cost recovery, uh, which is a significant thing. Um, uh, in closing here for this uh, subsection, I would like to say that a green fiscal reform has not taken off uh, due to obstacles such as special interest groupings lobbying against us in the African context, and then the lack of political will to push through with green fiscal reform in domestic economies, and then limited transparency and awareness of the benefits of green fiscal reform, as well as uh, the general administrative, institutional, and technological constraints associated with green fiscal reform. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there's been much talk about uh, using, uh, putting renewable energy at the center of um, uh, uh, um, uh, building back better. Um, so uh, renewable. So the, the, let me start off by saying the difference between the 2008 global financial crisis and the current uh, COVID-19 crisis is that the cost of renewable energy generation is now competitive with fossil fuels. Uh, with that in mind, uh, then we need to uh, enact policy reforms that will enable a decrease in renewable power costs. Uh, which will uh, uh, result in a, sh in, in a shift in the market and contribute towards a green recovery. Um, for example, governments can uh, stimulate demand in their local markets by elect electrifying their, economic, their economies uh, with renewable energy as the first uh, step to building back better. Uh, but governments should proceed with speed uh, to implement these uh, regulatory reforms. Uh, they must be also be fit for purpose, and they must also put a clean energy investment at the center of uh, the country's uh, economic recovery and economic stimulus packages. Um, and also the market design for these uh, stimulus packages uh, must provide long-term price visibility and streamlined uh, uh, permitting that uh, a streamline to enable a ramp up of the deployment of renewable energy. Uh, the Sawia in South Africa is of the view that uh, a, a green recovery plan in South Africa, for example, can be achieved by removing regulatory barriers, enabling the private sector to freely purchase a renewable energy. Um, uh, that's just an example. Uh, but it's important to bring on board cap private capital into renewable energy. And in order for that to happen, African governments must allow private sector 
um, private actors uh, to participate meaningfully in the sector. And by this, we don't mean privatization. We mean that deregulate the sector, allow for competition, and then competition uh, just means uh, allow more than one company to operate in the in, in the energy sector, that, other than your SOE uh, uh, sector. So there's been a report by the International Renewable Energy Agency that shows that accelerating investments in renewable energy could underpin the global economy's COVID-19 recovery by adding almost 100 trillion US dollars to GDP by 2050. And increasing renewable energy investments would in the long term pay for itself by returning between three to eight dollars for every one dollar invested. And it would also quadruple the number of jobs in the sector to 42 million over three decades. This is definitely something that would benefit the continent. And the last two points, um, next slide, please. Infrastructure investments. Uh, um, um, infrastructure with increased protectionism uh, 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 as a, a part of the post-COVID-19 future. Some countries will pursue a, an economic recovery strategy that places the state or government at the center of their economic growth. And uh, that will mean infrastructure will be the driver of growth. So a government must use public funding to uh, uh, reactivate economic growth using infrastructure, uh, uh, infrastructure development. So aggregate demand is expected to remain depressed in countries. Um, for some time now, meaning that government can uh, uh, enact uh, policy measures to stimulate economic activity through spending, to make them 21st century ready, and uh, by catalyzing investment in a modern carbon, zero carbon infrastructure system and a green energy environment. Uh, again, here you need private equity. Um, it can be effective as an alternative source of funding as many funds are now uh, ac assessing new strategies to allocate capital, including finding appeal to links to SDG programs. Um, Melissa, could I ask you to start uh, wrapping up? Another minute to go? Yes. Thanks. Okay, yes, perfect. Um, um, okay, so I just want to say, call to the economic recovery strategies of African countries will be the measures taken to stimulate supply and demand through substantial infrastructure build programs. The last uh, two uh, mechanisms, uh, green finance mechanisms, I won't go into much detail there. The last one is redirecting uh, existing funding as uh, uh, towards uh, um, uh, SDG-related uh, programs. Uh, for example, governments can uh, use public procurement uh, as a lever to achieve development impact. Uh, they can set regulations uh, to, uh, that says that uh, 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 at least 80 percent of public procurement must be allocated to green projects or used as green finance. And uh, Sarah, are you moving your slide? And the last one uh, on the last mechanism is uh, using stimulus investments uh, 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 that uh, focus on green. Um, here, uh, there are five pillars uh, for green recovery packages uh, that can be adopted by African countries. Uh, the first one is building a network infrastructure that is required for green and just transition. The second one is making the regulatory changes to unlock private sector investments in sustainable energy, water, waste, and sanitation. And then the fourth one is supporting localization of manufacturing technologies such as smart meters, biomaterial, electric vehicle, batteries, green hydrogen, while stimulating sustainable tourism and agriculture. The fourth one is improving access to sustainable services, such as sustainable housing and mobility. And the last one is uh, the implementation of fiscal reforms to remove fossil fuel uh, subsidies, uh, incentivize new green solutions, promote resource efficiency and preservation, and reform energy and water tap structures to make pricing inclusive and drive uh, behavioral change. And uh, in closing, um, 
uh, in closing, I'd just like to say that these, uh, uh, these, uh, the mechanisms that I discussed uh, here um, will be uh, uh, will be in a full uh, paper that they, that I will publish uh, by uh, next uh, in December uh, uh, on green financing mechanisms that are suitable for developing countries. Thank you. Great. Um, thanks very much, uh, Pelesa. Um, so this this paper, uh, as Pelesa says, will be coming out uh, soon uh, in in the next couple of months. Uh, she's busy. Uh, it's it's in it's in the production pipeline. The next presentation uh, by Dr. Basun Zenze is a paper that has in fact uh, come out and I will post it in the chat in the chat function uh, so you can uh, you can click onto it. Um, um, it, it looks at agricultural exports, African agricultural exports and, and uh, in the context of the China-US trade wars. A really interesting paper, some really interesting insights. I enjoyed reading it, uh, Basu, uh, a few weeks ago. So over to you. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. Right, would you be able to keep it to about 15 minutes or so, so that we also have time for... Absolutely. For even less, even less, perhaps. Okay. Right. <laughs> so we Thanks. have time to spare. All right, thank you, moderator, and thank you to your uh, staff at SIA, uh, Palesa, Serial, and Cynthia for uh, the invitation to speak today and to share some assessments and make some recommendations per today's topic. And as you rightly stated, the paper is online, so uh, folks can uh, engage with the with the with the paper and the recommendations there. Uh, so I've chosen the approach of the trade war for today's topic. Uh, because the Africa-China relationship occurs in a global context. So it's affected not only by bilateral uh, matters and developments, but also occurs in a global context. And therefore third party uh, perceptions and motivations are, are crucial and can play uh, a role and can in, in indeed introduce some new incentives. Uh, I've chosen agriculture on the other hand, because of its identified importance to the continent, uh, the AU states in Agenda 2063 that the continent should ensure better functioning of agriculture and food markets, including the lowering of market participation and increasing access to regional uh, and continental and global markets. Uh, although unforeseen at the time of, of the writing of this uh, Agenda 2063, no doubt, the US-China trade war uh, is a potential catalyst uh, and game changer. Of course, there's also the influence of COVID-19. There's also the, the factor of, uh, of climate change. So there's all these multiple crises, which I argue uh, present quite a lot of opportunity actually. Uh, importantly, moreover, I think the trade war presents us with a testable set of circumstances. It's confinable to a particular period uh, during which we can, we can note some trends. So I'm going to quickly share the presentation and speak to it. Are you sharing it? Are you having a problem? Ah, I am sharing. Right. There it is. Excellent. Excellent. There it is. So for my presentation today, I hope to uh, firstly speak a bit about the importance of trade uh, to, to Africa, uh, and then move on to talking about the trade war and Africa's development agenda. And then uh, look at some uh, findings in terms of African agricultural exports to China during the, the trade war and whether there is any sort of catalytic role that is seen or any change in magnitude uh, of African exports to China during this period compared to the previous number of years just before the initiation of the trade war. Then I will make some quick recommendations. So no doubt uh, trade is important to Africa's development. The figure that demonstrates the a very strong correlation between exports and growth in GDP in the continent. Consistently, whenever we see growth in exports, we also see growth in GDP. Wherever we see decline in exports, uh, we also see decline in GDP. Um, the the uh, continent in its agenda 2063, in its first aspiration, uh, envisions uh, a world-class infrastructure 
uh, accompanied by trade facilitation, which it argues will see intra-African trade uh, growing from less than 12% in 2013 to about 50% by 2045. And so Africa's share of global uh, trade looking outward now, uh, out outside of the continent, uh, will rise from 2% to 12%. Um, the the uh, African Development Bank, on the other hand, argues that trade is the cornerstone of economic development by African countries, and argues that the cases of Botswana, Mauritius, Namibia, have all transformed themselves from low income to middle income status by improving their ability to trade in regional and global markets. Uh, so as we've seen, uh, Africa really accounts for very little in terms of global uh, economic uh, exports and global trade. Um, the continent also remains overly dependent on the export of raw materials uh, so that growth levels, uh, which uh, we, we should all be aware, tend to fluctuate in the, in the commodities market. Uh, so there's a strong need for diversification. Um, and, and indeed, if Africa were to, a lot of studies prove this, were to increase uh, its share of world trade by just 1%, that single percentage point uh, would in nominal terms, nominal terms see about 70 billion of additional income for the, uh, for the continent, which is about three times the total amount of development assistance the continent receives from the rest of the world. Uh, and as the likes of Rwanda will prove to us, we need more trade uh, rather than aid. The country has managed to uh, substantially increase its, uh, its, its GDP and its government revenue uh, from, from dependence on, on uh, aid to more of a, of a trade-based economy. Uh, so from about 80% uh, you know, two decades ago to, to less than 30% uh, of, of Rwanda's revenues, come from, from aid and, in, and that number is declining. So uh, let's look at uh, agriculture uh, and why it, uh, it, is the, it is a particular, particularly interesting um, uh, sector to look at when it comes to the trade war. What we have here are US uh, exports to China of agricultural products. Uh, we see particularly a steep decline between 2018 and 2019. Uh, which tells us that, uh, you know, normalcy in the relationship was interrupted. And of course, 2018 18 was the year in which the trade war between, uh, between uh, China and the U.S. was initiated uh, by President Trump. So how this came about is, is that since the U.S. had initiated uh, the trade war and introduced tariffs on Chinese products, China in turn reciprocated with its own tariffs, particularly around US agricultural produce. And so I argue that this is a major opportunity for Africa. It has been a major opportunity, which I think has not been adequately taken advantage of in the past two to three years. So farm experts, uh, exports under Obama did indeed fall by about 25 billion in, in Obama's final year in office, uh, but they, to use the term collapsed, after the, the, the introduction of the, of the trade war. We can see the figure there, the diminishing uh, role of China. China in 2018 is the huge red bar in that graph. And yet by, by 2019, it had shrink, it had shrunk uh, quite substantially. Uh, in fact, China has already replaced much of its uh, US soybean imports, for example, by looking at, uh, at Brazil and other Latin American and Caribbean uh, exporters. So what about Africa's case? Well, looking at, um, you know, region by region, if we look at ECOWAS, we can see that uh, actually it's uh, almost counterintuitive that the, uh, the region's exports to China, and these are all exports to China, uh, of, for example, edible fruits as well as livestock, uh, had actually grown between 2016 and 2017, uh, but have been declining substantially uh, since uh, 2018, uh, which tells us that the, you know, the introduction of the trade war with the incentives that it, it introduced has not substantially been uh, sufficiently been taken advantage of. Uh, similarly, in, uh, in the case of, uh, of, of the East African community, um, we see the, the, the tobacco, for example, to exports to China growing between 2016 and 2017, but since then declining uh, quite a bit. Uh, 
um, similarly with uh, with edible fruits they've been uh, inconsistent there've been years of growth uh, and 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 years of decline but encouragingly in the previous uh, in the most recent data we have they were indeed growing so of course africa was not the only region that was looking at the trade war and looking to take advantage of the market that was what is essentially abdicated by the united states in terms of agriculture uh, other regions too were also looking at this uh, development with some keen uh, some keenness uh, some interest uh, so you know when we look at asia when we look at uh, latin america and the caribbean we actually see that they are exports to to um, to to china of agricultural goods have actually been increasing uh, over the the entire uh, you know two year period we have seen um, you know, the, the, the Asia as exports to China of agricultural goods grow by almost 80%. Uh, similarly, uh, the, the uh, Latin American and Caribbean regions have seen uh, their agricultural exports grow by uh, 84%, uh, whereas Africa's own exports have actually been diminishing. If you can see the first three set of graphs, uh, on the on the screen there. So from 2017 in the blue to the red in in uh, in in 2019. So there's a decline. Whereas if you look at Asia, uh, actually it's been growing quite consistently. And so what I think was a missed opportunity here was the 2018 Forecast Summit, because we saw the, the you know the African leaders taking a stand and vocalizing support for China uh, against the United States, uh, you know, presenting China as the last defender of, or the last major defender of, uh, of multipolarity, of openness, and, and, and uh, sort of portraying the United States as, uh, as a closed off, protectionistic, uh, you know, uh, America first. Uh, nonetheless, there wasn't sufficient uh, work done uh, there to ensure that Africa closes the gap. Uh, it seems to me that this was more of a soft power kind of uh, kind of a posture rather than uh, one that was also pragmatic. Yes, uh, critiquing the United States, but also then uh, gaining, for example, purchase guarantees from the from the from 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 China. The Falkirk summit took place about two months after the first set of tariffs were introduced on uh, on the on China. And so it's a majorly missed opportunity uh, that I think should be looked at in the next FOCAC summit. Uh, another area of, of interest, just to branch off from agriculture a bit, has been the, the other sort of sideshow of the, of the US-China uh, trade war. And that is the, 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 you know, the uh, banning of certain Chinese technologies and banning of American companies from doing business with these Chinese uh, counterparts. And the most uh, notable of these, of course, is the Google-Huawei uh, relationship, uh, which has been, uh, has been mandated to be broken off by the United States, thereby forcing Huawei to have to develop uh, its own ecosystem, because what Google is, is really an ecosystem. Uh, you know, there's the search engine, uh, there's the operating system, there's the app store. Uh, so when Huawei devices can no longer be compatible with those Google devices, those uh, those Google-owned uh, platforms, uh, there is clearly a, an opportunity for 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 uh, for Huawei to first of all develop its own operating system, which they are. It's called Harmony Operating System. But this operating system, and indeed Huawei has admitted as much that the CEO of Huawei, it won't be intuitive. It won't be readily intuitive uh, in the same way that Android is because of its of its familiarity, and so. Huawei is in a sense um, incentivized to work with many uh, friends and partners and to seek, and seek partners globally. And yet what we've seen is the gap being readily closed more actively, at least uh, how Huawei being engaged by uh, you know, businesses and, and, and developers in, in the UAE, in Russia and in India. Africa, I think has been nowhere to be seen. Uh, and so this is a, this is a, a low hanging fruit, if you will, that can be, 
that can be easily retrieved to the mutual benefit of both. Because on the one hand, uh, you know, African developers will, will, uh, will of course gain a, a market, but also Huawei will uh, have a more synergy uh, and intuitively built operating systems and search engines with other, uh, you know, regions. Uh, and so my proposal here is really for a patchwork of, of, of search engines globally that could in effect break the monopoly of, of Google because of the growth of Huawei. Imagine then Huawei being compatible with new sort of regional operating systems. Uh, so we move from a digital iron curtain to digital multipolarity uh, because there is this gap that, that is being uh, availed by this politicization of, uh, of, of, of technology. And indeed about 86% of all searches uh, are, 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 are via Google. And in some cases such as South Africa, the number is even higher about 99% uh, of those searches uh, are on, on Google. And indeed about a third of smartphones in South Africa, for example, the number is even higher in other African countries. A third of smartphone devices are uh, Huawei devices. Uh, and indeed, uh, you know, search is a, not a neutral industry. And so support for government support for, you know, African developers to work with Huawei uh, would not be uh, anything extraordinary. Uh, indeed, Google paid Apple. Uh, the reason, uh, you know, every Apple device since 2017 comes with Google pre-installed is because Google paid Apple about $9 billion to, to incentivize the take up of, uh, of, of, of Google. In China, Baidu, uh, which now accounts for about 60% of the Chinese search market uh, in an ecosystem where there are literally hundreds of search engines, saw early the future of, uh, of, of search and the growth of the internet in China. And so approached every single, as many internet cafes as they could to incentivize them to introduce uh, their search engine as the landing page on their search engines. And so, you know, support for, for, for budding search engines, if you will, would not be anything extraordinary. And we already have a, quite a close relationship between the continent and, and China, as well as incentives to cooperate, uh, born from crisis, but opportunities uh, nonetheless. And so to close off, uh, I think what we've seen is, is impetus for increased intracontinental trade, which has its, uh, its, its, you know, its own set of uh, imperatives that it brings about. And at the same time, the outbreak of COVID-19, <clears throat> excuse me, and the manner that it diffused to the continent from Europe tells us really that probably we're more inter integrated to Europe than to each other. Uh, it's, it's rather symbolic, but I think it uh, gives an impetus for increased, uh, increased trade uh, and increased integration within the continent. In the case of the agricultural uh, dynamics we've seen, I think there is a need for, of course, supporting of farmers. Uh, and in this regard, I would you know, recommend uh, the examination of the success factors behind the US, behind uh, Brazil, behind Asia, and they are su the successes of their farmers. I think one early lesson here has been that actually farmers need to be better organized and need to lobby uh, for, for subsidies uh, and to need to make a case uh, for agriculture-based development that is agriculture that is uh, export uh, oriented. There also need to be policies, of course, geared towards limitation of biological threats. Even before COVID-19, you know, agriculture is a very tenuous uh, sector. It's very vulnerable. We've seen this year, for example, the locust uh, plague in, uh, in, in, in East Africa. Uh, we've seen, you know, worms and, and, and things such as in Zambia last year, but which were caught on and detected quite early. That is the kind of, 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 of program uh, and kind of uh, early detection that needs to, to pervade so that we don't, so to speak, put all our eggs in one basket and at the same time, not ensure those, uh, those baskets. Uh, there's also, of course, a need to train emerging farmers for export orientation and letting them know of the immense opportunities that exist in China, especially around pork, you know, uh, because of the, of the recent swine flu, which we, which we saw about two years 
uh, ago, between 2018 and, and 2019. Of course, FOCAC, uh, African countries will need to uh, take opportunity, take advantage of the opportunity presented by FOCAC, uh, which is taking place next year. But I think even in the lead up to FOCAC, because the preparatory work begins quite early to ensure uh, and you know, purchase commitments uh, from China, uh, because it's in the interest of both. If you look at the trade war and how it's spoken about and how China is spoken about in the US, you can tell that uh, in the long term, either party, whoever is, you know, is in the White House, there is this sense of uh, you know, disengagement from China uh, by both parties. And so it's really in the interest of both China and Africa to increase uh, their agricultural uh, relationship. Our culture is also, you know, has, should I ask you uh, to uh, to wrap up, please? Okay, I'm almost there. Um, right. So I think also then joint agricultural uh, ventures. Uh, I think this, uh, you know, helps in in two ways. It helps, uh, you know, uh, China have a stake in the in the African in the growing African industries, but it also helps, um, you know, African countries best know uh, to gain information as to which products are particularly needed in China uh, for, for a given period. And so with those, uh, with those few recommendations, um, uh, I think there's quite a lot of opportunity that can emerge from these crises, these multiple crises that we have seen. And to sum it all up, I would say, create local capacity for export orientation. The incentives have lined up like never before. And so the task and the onus is on Africa and African governments to show up the, the continent's export capacity. All right, thank you. Great, uh, thanks uh, Basu. Uh, also a lot of uh, interesting food for thought there, both on the digital side as well as on the agricultural side. I like the word digital multipolarity. Um, uh, let's let's move on quickly. I'm mindful that I've probably not been a very good uh, uh, keeper of the time. Um, uh, let's see if we can uh, if we can catch up a little bit. Uh, let me hand over to Weiwei Chen, uh, who will be talking to us about uh, about Ethiopia and, and and manufacturing and industrialization. Over to you, Weiwei. Thank you. What I will do is I will sort of raise my hand at sure. uh, point just to. I'll tell you two or three minutes to go, whatever. Okay, maybe we should do it that way. Over yes. to you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation. And it's my pleasure to be presented here. And today I'm going to present a topic regarding China's manufacturing and Africa's industrialization, a case study of uh, uh, Chinese manufacturing investment in Ethiopia. Let's order food. So, Chinese investment in Africa has been increased significantly since the turn of this century. Um, I saw, I moved, they were here. I was going, mm. Could I ask uh, people yes. to turn off their and mics? Or official statistics, can I carry on? Um, official statistics of Chinese investment in Africa reveal a paradoxical picture. It is both big and small. It is small in the sense that Chinese investment have come late to Africa, and this investment account for a very small share of the total Chinese investment in terms of stock. Until the end of 2017, its investment to Africa account for only 2.4%. But it is also big in the relative sense that the dynamics of Chinese investment are robust and the pace of its investment growth is very fast. In 2017, Chinese investment flow to Africa reached 4.11 billion US dollar with an annual growth of 70.8%. So Africa has become the fastest growing target market of Chinese investment among the five continents. Um, in the speech given at FOCA 2015, Chinese President Xi Jinping indicates that China has a strong desire to continue to strengthen its strategic partnership with Africa. The FOCA 2015 encouraged Chinese trade with Africa and the Chinese firms to invest and engage in manufacturing and thereby facilitate employment and skills transfers. The AGOA, the African Growth Opportunity Act, for instance, has given China a means to export to the European and the US market via certain African countries by, um, with duty-free access. This act is particularly important given the um, current Sino-US trade tensions 
and may push China to invest more aggressively to Africa um, to have continued export market access and to strengthen economic, social, political ties with the continent, with the con continued in, in the face of the turbulence elsewhere. So the private and uh, in 2018 focus summit, President Xi encouraged firms to invest more than 10 billion US dollars in Africa over the following three years. Private enterprises are critical in realizing China's economic aspiration of industrial capacity cooperation and, the, and the strategic complementary in Africa. Chinese manufacturing investment, predominant by the private sector, has become much more significant in certain African countries where the proactive policy was used as a token to attract manufacturing investment and infuse it strategically and into national development and a structural transformation agenda. So the changing role of China and its growing manufacturing investment to Africa has profound implication to, for African countries such as Ethiopia. The Ethiopian government is eager to transition its economy from agricultural-led growth to light manufacturing-led growth. And this strategic direction was explicitly stated in its first growth transformation plan and has been further promoted in the second one. Vision 2025 aims to make Ethiopia the leading manufacturing hub in Africa. Um, economically, Ethiopia enjoyed a double-digit growth rate and over three-fold increase in per capita income in the past 15 years. Um, its economic growth in the past decade can partially be attributed to Ethiopia's proactive government policy and committed political leadership. However, as a landlocked natural resource scarce country, Ethiopia lacks any significant source of mineral exports. Thus, it hasn't benefited from the commodity boom as a potential source of industrial investment capital. Capital, therefore, has derived from main sources, domestic savings, external development aid and concession loans, and FDI. Um, China has become Ethiopia's large source of investment, the most important trade partner and the source of infrastructure construction services. According to the EIC data, China ranked first in the past two decades in terms of total investment projects. And both statistic, um, official statistics and empirical um, evidence that were collected in my research show that Chinese private sector plays a dominant role in manufacturing FDI in Ethiopia. So um, based on the EIC data, I have created two chats uh, regarding about FDI to uh, Ethiopia and man Chinese manufacturing investment um, in Ethiopia in the past two decades. And, and I divided this into five different periods according to Ethiopia's development agenda. In the first two agenda periods uh, between 1991 and 2004, very few Chinese firms actually would present in Ethiopia due to the political turbulence and the unfavorable inve investment environment in the host country. And the launch of FOCA 2000 marked the very beginning of China's visible economic activities in Ethiopia, such as uh, manufacturing investments. And in the third period between 2005 and 2010, the FOCA 2006 summit launched uh, the program for China-Africa cooperation in economic and social development. The objective of this program was to share Chinese experience with attracting investment and creating um, um, FDI groups through utilizing special economic zoom as major tools. And SEZ projects in 19 countries, including Ethiopia, were identified by the Chinese government in this program. For instance, the Eastern Industry Park is Ethiopia's very first industry park open since 2008. Um, it's operated and constructed, developed by Chinese private firms, Jiangsu Yongyang Group. And this program has been received a great deal of support by both Chinese and Ethiopian government. Um, the support has come from the highest level with the visit from the prime minister of the Ethiopian government. In addition to Ethiopia's commitments, the Chinese government has also shown great support through its Overseas Economic Trade Cooperation Zone program at both central and the local levels. The central government 
provides support such as grants to developers and long-term loans. The EIP is a mixed industry park with Chinese private firms come from different kind of manufacturing sectors, such as light manufacturing industry, for instance, garment, textile, footwear, and uh, plastic uh, slippers, and the construction material industry, such as cement, steel rebar, aluminum products, and uh, uh, ceramic ties. And as of September 2018, there were in total 86 firms in the Eastern Industry Park. And 78 out of 86 are Chinese private firms in manufacturing industry. And those 78 Chinese firms create nearly 15,000 jobs for locals with an average localization rate of nearly 93%, which was phenomenal. Um, during the fourth period between 2010 and 2015, Ethiopia launched its first growth transformation plan. Two important strategies have been identified by the Ethiopian government. The first one was to attract leading geese. The export-oriented manufacturing industry has been prioritized as key strategic industry and the benefit from policy reform. The Ethiopian government had to ta also target firms from leading geese. This came from their realization that they need to attract technologically advanced firms from countries with higher costs that can benefit from Ethiopia's cost advantages. And the second strategy is the industrial park strategy. And Ethiopia focused on industrialization and China with its going on strategy and the program example of such uh, example or policy that few China's and Ethiopian interests together to convert over the last two decades. Thus, China has promoted the creation of industry parks as part of the Belt Road Initiative. And this has led to it playing an important role um, in Ethiopia's industry park development. In fact, the development of industry parks have been marked a big success in attracting and facilitating high quality investment in Ethiopia. A good um, uh, successful exemplifying example is the Hua Jian Shu Manufacturing. In 2011, responding to the further proactive going up policy, King invitation by the then Prime Minister Meli Zanawi, supported by the Chinese Guangdong provincial government and Hua Jian's clients, the chairman of Hua Jian decided to invest in Ethiopia. Hua Jian started its production in 2012 and then decided to expand its production by creating its own industry zone in 2015. Hua Jian Light Industry City is a flagship project with a demonstrating effort on South-South cooperation under the Belt Road Initiative. It is project to procure a two billion US dollar investment and yield four billion US dollar in, um, in returns over 10 years. Whiting promised to create 100,000 jobs for locals by 2025. Thus, it is playing the role of a leading geese, exploring new markets that give other potential investors assurance that investment of such a kind in Ethiopia is feasible. Turning to the next period, that is, um, between 2015-16 to um, till now, that is the Ethiopian uh, government focused more on um, develop industrial park with high specialization and attract investment into Ethiopia from the entire supply chain. Because the Ethiopian government in this industry aimed at the garment industry, this kind of uh, strategy has been evolved and Ethiopia government realized that the importance of global value chain dynamics in particular, that global buyers are key drivers of encouraging their first tail suppliers to invest in new countries. So since 2016, there is a new wave of Chinese export firms in the light manufacturing industry who have stopped their investment in Ethiopia. But different from Hua Jian, um, these companies are a strict uh, supplier of those brand company in the US and Europe without intermediate agents such as buyer or the uh, buyers or traders. And the zero investment to Ethiopia were uh, motivated, is driven by both buyers and the Ethiopian government to form a vertical integration of the supply chain. An exemplifying case is the Hawassa Industry Park, which is the flagship industry park in Ethiopia. It showcased the tripatric cooperation between the PBH group from the US, 
the Ethiopian government and the strategic suppliers of PVH, such as Chinese company Wu Shijing Mao. Meanwhile, a key part of uh, the second growth and transformation plan is for Ethiopia to reduce its dependency on imported goods. In recent years, the Ethiopian government is more dedicated to attracting capital intensive, knowledge intensive, value added manufacturing industries such as pharmaceutical industries. Companies such as uh, uh, Sunshine, um, sorry, companies such as um, Sunshine Pharmaceutical and Human Wears Pharmaceutical, both of these companies are probably listed company from the Chinese stock market who have been invested in Ethiopia since 2016 and 17 respectively. So overall, it is clear to see that the Sino-Ethiopia relations have evolved from political and diplomatic engagement in the last century to a new dimension of full age strategic cooperation and economic partnership. The growth in Chinese manufacturing investment in Ethiopia has been remarkable, barely existing in 2000, but now surpassing other countries. And both China and Ethiopia's interests has converged with Ethiopia seeking to attract investment to accelerate its manufacturing capabilities based in its special economic zones. And China looking to export its development model, relocate over capacity and the labor intensive industries. As what Professor Ch Fentu Charu and Dr. Akabe claimed, the rise of China neither necessarily produce a new colonial type relationship nor does it automatically guarantee African countries the freedom of determining their own development paths without external intrusion. In the end, the management of Chinese FDI in Africa is an ongoing learning process for all stakeholders to work on together. It's end of my presentation, thank you. Great, uh, thanks, uh, thanks Weiwei. Um, and again, uh, a really interesting interesting uh, uh, set of uh, findings based on, on work on the ground. As I said, all of these uh, uh, PowerPoints will be available on, 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 uh, on our website. I know a number of people have asked. Um, uh, thanks. Thanks very much. And thanks to, for keeping to, um, to time. Right. Let's move on then speedily to our uh, two respondents panelists, uh, uh, Lauren and Kwame. If I can ask you uh, to sort of make your observations of, for about five to seven minutes, uh, so that we then still have about twenty minutes of, of Q and A, and we can take. Let me ask you again, please, everybody. If you do have questions, I know there are a couple of uh, comments being posted in the Q and A. Do post them there, and 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 we will try to get uh, to them. I also noted that we will be putting up an evaluation a link on the in the chat function. Please look out for it. It shouldn't take you too long to to fill it in. It makes us uh, uh, improve uh, what uh, what we have to offer. Lauren, let's start with you. Yeah. Um, hello. Can you can I be heard? Um, so first of all, thank you to all the speakers. This was this was great and and so different. Like first from Elizabeth, not only a wonderful induction introduction for all of us, but the kind of the the after issue and how you work out the balance between focusing on intra African trade versus development through extra African trade. Um, and Ambassador Chen gave us a a, a great overview, which. You know, he mentioned these key areas of energy transition, infrastructure, and digital commerce. You know, he was very pointed in pointing out Ali Alipay's role and um, ZTE's role in building kind of frontier commerce and infrastructure. And Palessa gave us a, a, a very kind of detailed overview of green finance, which I felt kind of brought together those those two issues because it's the, the detail of how do you make the energy transition work and how can you make it work sustainably, which was debt sustainability was an issue Ambassador Chen brought up as well. So I thought that was a kind of a, a lovely thing. And our, our, the, the point that, that wasn't linked between Palessa and the ambassador was the AIIB. So the ambassador mentioned the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank but didn't mention, or, or later it wasn't mentioned that the AIIB is quite at the frontier of thinking about sustainable green finance. So I, I think even just this week, 
the AIIB agreed some kind of new investment framework based on with a with a European asset manager. It's called Amundi, I think, based on the climate change investment framework, based on the Paris Agreement, and I guess implicitly the Paris Club. So in this whole kind of China Africa thing, this AIIB, there's that 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 multilateral angle, and the AIIB is quite at that frontier, but working very closely with European investment managers around the Paris Agreement and Paris Club principles. So maybe, you know, to kind of bring Palesa and the ambassador's points together into the AIIB in this kind of multilateral framework. And then Dr. Basso gave us a, a, a kind of a global and more detailed overview of trade issues. Um, I'm, I'm Australian, which means I'm kind of from the China future, but I'm kind of from the China past. Um, and I noticed you didn't talk at all about Australia or New Zealand's agricultural trade history with China, which maybe there's some lessons there. And maybe New Zealand hasn't burned as many bridges as Australia recently. Um, those two countries were quite ahead of the curve in selling agricultural goods to China, and there may be something that can be learned for better and for worse, um, both in the, the, the startup sense and in the how it evolves over time sense. So even though they're not big global players, don't forget those kind of, and, you know, um, uh, Dr. Basso also highlighted the need to understand the Chinese market, which I thought was great, like the importance of pork, you know, you kind of tap into these, what what's happening in the Chinese market, what is their development plans, you really need someone kind of keeping you up to date with those key, you know, five year plans or bigger plans and, and the, the different market segments. And just one quick point on how China even does that. I mean, TikTok is wonderful for helping Chinese to understand how young Americans are incentivized and inspired. And one of the great new e-commerce platforms for selling clothes to teens in America is Chinese. So this is like, maybe there's some tensions with the kind of Biden generation and the Trump generation, but the Chinese are busy tapping into this younger generation who maybe won't have the same, the same attitude or a difference. So it's understanding those different segments and tapping into the future. Um, so I, I wouldn't forget that in, in the, and remember that young Chinese have grown up in a very rich country. So they're, they're like on average, if they're from the coast, at least if they're from coastal China, they're, they, they've grown up in a very prosperous world, which is quite different to their parents. So again, understanding all these, these changes over time and can Africa even help China's population aging problem? Like all these, all these different ways to tap in. And then Weiwei's, um, oh, um, and one other point, sorry, that, that Dr. Basso mentioned, he was talking about the digital ecosystems and Google and how they kind of, I, I believe that the main phone made in Africa is transition and that's a Chinese phone. And I think that also has inbuilt ecosystem and inbuilt apps. So, you know, possibly those that promote Alipay services or otherwise. So this is like quite a, it's quite a frontier of competition, even just at the phone app inbuilt level. So if maybe China's leaders are, sorry, African leaders are all using iPhones, but if the everyday trader is using the transition phone and those apps, you know, you have this kind of amazing digital ecosystem divide between the African elites on their iPhones and, and the much more local traders on their transition phones. So all these kind of issues, you know, to look at and how they affect the African market and African future markets. Um, and then Weiwei, thank you for the, the really detailed kind of China, Ethiopia investment frontier. You know, this is such a interesting labor intensive and industrialization focused relationship. And I really like that the point about learning, about learning from each other and, and, and in, the, in the sense of, you know, learning from China, I think Africa, doesn't do enough of learning what China did with its international investors. So fair enough, learn that China focused on this investment or it incentivized labor and testing and labor in labor rich investment. But how did it do that? Like what were the details of the contracts with its own foreign investors? Like not, not just the kind of macro story, but really like the detail 
were they almost all joint ventures? And how can Africa replicate that joint venture model? And also remember that in the 1980s, when China started this out, those partnerships were, were also very difficult, very I, I, primitive isn't the right word, but you know they were very, very new and it took a long time for them to evolve to where they are today. So don't ever judge a joint venture between China and Africa today by China's joint ventures today. Judge them by the struggles of China's joint ventures in the 1980s, you know, which, which was a much more difficult, slow process. But they, they insisted, they just insisted on these joint ventures and being able to absorb the learning very slowly. So maybe each African country can, um, can work that out themselves. And I know just, just one more um, point on that and understanding the third markets, which was um, really Dr. Basso's point. And I think like there's a maybe, you know, African countries like the EAC may be able to, well, it's not a country, but may be able to learn from how ASEAN relates to China, you know, and, and again, like I know Australia and, and New Zealand are, are not big countries, but they have a long, intense trade relationship with China on primary commodities. So this is the thing on, on minerals trade, on agricultural trade. Um, so the, maybe there is something that can be learned from, from those. So don't forget those kind of unusual case studies, the kind of South Korea-China relationship, the Israel-China relationship, and the ASEAN-China relationship. It's very easy to look at Europe and America, but actually it might be those smaller frontier, kind of close to China relationships that started much earlier and tend to be a, a testing ground. And as I said, in the case of ASEAN, Australia and New Zealand, they're also very primary, at least on the trade level, they're very primary commodities based. So maybe there's, there's useful partnerships on that, on that front. And thank you. Yeah, that was, that was great, everyone. Thanks. Great, Lauren. I think a really great way of bringing everything together. So uh, thanks very much. Um, let's see if we can pick some of those up uh, briefly in the Q&A. Uh, over to you, Kwame. And again, joining us from uh, Kenya, from Nairobi. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And thanks to, to the presenters who've done a fantastic job. So in the five minutes that I have, I'll just talk about four issues. And I'll start with the, with the ambassador's fantastic presentation. And uh, starting with, the, I think, um, I was going to say it last, but maybe I should say it fast. Uh, it's a bit of a touchy subject, but I think it's, uh, uh, it needs to be stated. Um, I think one of the things that COVID-19 has done, because we're speaking in this period, <clears throat> is that um, I think it has structurally damaged some African economies. And so the ambassadors call about its effects on the uh, viability of public debt and uh, viability of existing stock of debt and its repayment is an issue. The ambassador mentioned obviously uh, um, in perfect diplomatic language about the fact that 15 African countries uh, will get an opportunity for some relief, which is fine. Uh, what is unclear to me standing back here is uh, that, um, I mean, what's the model? I mean, or rather, what's the rationale for the 15 and not others? Because I know there are many more countries that, uh, that might want that kind of relief. Of course, at the OECD level and globally, there are some countries that actually have a view that this should have been coordinated. It, it, it's clear that China is taking a unilateral approach, which is enti entirely its own um, uh, choice, obviously, but that would have been more interesting to talk about. So I think that's, a, that's an interesting one. Uh, the second point will be about Palisa's presentation, which is also appreciated. And we're talking here about, uh, I just try and pick up what tensions exist. We, we, we are talking here about, um, you're right, Palisa is completely right, that African countries speaking about the, the continent have not exhausted the possibility of using green energy sources and towards ending towards um, a less carbon intensive future uh, in energy production, but also across other areas. And my view is that that might have something to do with legacy policies. So for instance, Kenya, Kenya has had uh, huge opportunities for investment. I mean, it's very capital intensive on geothermal sources. Um, and we also have had new investments existing in, um, in energy, in uh, wind energy, um, which is supposed to be some kind of global standard uh, case study. But I think the, the main constraint in Kenya, for instance, is what we call, what an economist would call a transition gains trap. What happened is that Kenya has 30 year um, contracts, uh, which tells us something I think which should also inform African negotiations with Chinese companies or the I mean, private sector, state corporations and the government itself. 
Kenya has outstanding 30 year contracts, which, which compel the purchase of energy from carbon intensive uh, sources, uh, because obviously there were gaps and then new investments came. Part of what the investment required is basically a guarantee of 30 year purchase. Very, very bad uh, ways of negotiating. But the problem is because these are legacy, that transition is so difficult to make. So while uh, cleaner energy sources exist, there's just not enough money to actually spend in activating those choices. So perhaps that's one thing to, to bear in mind as well. Uh, uh, thirdly, I'll speak about Dr. Basu's um, uh, presentation as well. I think that's fantastic too. Um, talking about the fact that yes, there are opportunities to explore regarding the trade war and some of that might provide new opportunities, but it's I think uh, education that I think uh, trade wars are largely speaking political fights, uh, but they have spillovers for, <laughs> for the economic side. And for those who are policy scholars like ourselves, I think it's important for us to phrase it like that. And you've done a fantastic job and be circulating these to my colleagues as well. It's, 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 a, it's a fantastic paper. One of the things that I think Dr. Basso, and I will not put words into your mouth, but I think Dr. Basso, you're probably too optimistic about after. African continental free trade area. And knowing this African continent itself, um, I understand the tensions that take place between African countries as well. And I'm not too sure, to be honest, that it's such a rosy picture into the future regarding after as we do, because I know it's a transition against gap as well, but it's a political economy effect as well, which you also mentioned in the paper. I think the domestic political economy uh, in many African countries uh, will pressure governments when the real effects of what after would mean. I'm not too sure that many African enterprises, um, especially those that have political power and access to government offices are actually prepared for inter-African competition. So as scholars, I think let's put that on the, on, on, on the top. And it's one of the things in which I think would be a major leader or rather a major index about whether after will succeed and the pace at which uh, all arguments will be completed. Coming now to the final one, my fourth point, way way. Fantastic again. I think it is clear that your example shows that, uh, or rather, uh, I think this your example shows that an export focus is certainly the way for many African countries to go, irrespective of the size of those economies. My fear is that COVID uh, has given some impetus again to domestic um, manufacturers who are trying to have an import substitution look. Um, um, and this might again, and they have access to governments and many governments look at what the structural damage that occurred or rather the, the effects. And they might think that, yes, it's actually quite um, productive to be inward looking and try to concentrate on domestic markets. But I think it's an example to emulate partly because it suggests two things that without linking to global value chains, um, I think domestic uh, manufacturing will do much less I mean, or rather will be less efficient but more importantly, the most important thing is to raise the productivity of African workers, even if you choose mass um, employment and obviously the opportunity. So I think, yes, you're tying the whole picture, which is a good lesson for everybody to, to consider. What I'd like for you to consider is that the idea of special economic zones is one that's sold in African countries as a panacea. I do not think it is, but obviously it can be done very reasonably, especially if African countries choose proper product spaces, export product spaces to go through um, to try and see how do you jump from one product space to another, which will provide extreme value. I also think that one of the other, uh, I'm not too sure about what happened in the Eastern, um, uh, the example that you gave us, but there are huge concessions that African countries have given that sometimes give me the impression that actually, special economic zones actually hide the real costs of executing them. So for instance, if a, if a corporation comes into the African continent and asks an African government that conditional or now establishing in your country, we will require free access to water for 15 years, free access to land and all those, those all are economic costs. So the way we measure the costs and benefits of special economic zones is one area that um, perhaps is something to examine and perhaps your research has given us a question to actually examine and see all these special economic zones for the real value, values that they are. Because if they are conditioned on those huge subsidies that are not counted as part of their costs, then perhaps they're less effective economically than they are and they're less productive. Thank you very much and congratulations to all of you. Great, thanks Kwame. Uh, I think a really great way to, uh, to end all the presentations. I think highlighting some, uh, uh, both some of the issues around uh, particular models uh, on the continent that also I would argue require much more uh, uh, further uh, study also in, in Africa around the, 
uh, the pros and cons, but I think also your cautionary tale about the African continental free trade um, area. Just a very, very big thank you to all our, our, our panelists and presenters. I think it's been a really, really rich um, uh, discussion. Right, I'm going to move quickly on then with the remaining time that we have to a um, couple of questions that have been raised in the in the Q&A box. And uh, the first, and, and some of them also include comments, but in the interests of time, I'm just going to try to focus on the questions. Um, the one question, uh, the first question relates to what does China propose to do to correct the trade imbalance? And here we're talking about between, uh, between China and South Africa. Uh, and import more manufactured goods rather than just raw materials. So some of the uh, the points that have been raised, I think, in in, in some of the presentations around uh, also the, the the fact that a lot of the um, the exports to China are are in primary commodities, and that there is actually a trade imbalance, certainly in the in the in the South African uh, context. That's the one question. I'm going to go through all of them and then give you an opportunity to respond to the ones that you think you can. The next one is really more a comment um, uh, about uh, some uh, a dialogue, a high level dialogue for supporting priority Africa in the COVID-19 and the post COVID context. Uh, it, uh, it was organized jointly with the Chinese National Commission, UNESCO uh, and the Africa China online high level di dialogue. Uh, and it shared experiences uh, and served as a platform to explore partnerships and opportunities around uh, various topics, including education, science, ICT, and so on. Um, so that's really just a, a comment. And then um, a question uh, by uh, Sanusha Naidu to Palesa specifically. Uh, she says, what is your view that this approach to greening the financial system requires more than just a technical policy instrument uh, or just technical policy instruments, because the real crisis is the financial model itself. Uh, she says what is needed is a new thinking on how the contemporary financial model can be re-engineered because it seems that this is more an attempt to incorporate green policy into a system that is inherently flawed. In other words, simply just adding on to, to an existing structure rather than uh, uh, needing to sort of re reconstitute it and rethink it. And then the last, that's the one question, not the last. Uh, and then uh, another question um, by Stevens Mohalapa. Um, uh, if Africa is to benefit from the Africa-China relationship through FOCAC, it should first fully implement the Africa free trade agreement and do more with itself, trade with itself. Uh, how can African countries benefit and maximize FOCAC to enhance African trade? Uh, and this is also some of the issues, uh, one of the issues that uh, Kwame picked up on in his presentation. And then lastly, another question from Sanusha. Um, can the panelists and discussants comment on some of the thinking that is emerging from Chinese think tanks of a subtle alignment uh, of, B, uh, of BRI or fusion with the African uh, uh, continental free trade area? So that's the BRI. Uh, and where does this then leave FOCAC? All right, shall we, those are the questions. Uh, let's, so we've got 10 minutes or so to, to respond to them. Um, shall we start with, uh, well, let's, let's go from the top. So the, the question around trade imbalances, but also importantly, the kinds of products that are exported and imported. I don't know if, who would uh, feel comfortable answering, uh, taking that question, reveal yourself. Uh, you're, you're muted. Thanks. Thanks. So first of all, thank you to the, uh, the two respondents. It's amazing what you, know, you can miss uh, while analyzing something very narrow, but I've taken a lot of notes. So on the issue of the trade imbalance, I think quite frankly, and to be fair, this is not a question for China to answer. I think it's a matter of African countries themselves shoring up their own export capacities and, and export products, which is something I would have liked to emphasize also from my, from my presentation. Uh, it's a market just like any other, and therefore it's the onus is on, on, on African countries and various sectors to, to, to increase their exports to China. Nice. 
now muted. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Basu. Um, Palessa, do you want to take the question on uh, the what Sanusha is raising about simply bolting on uh, uh, green policy into exist and into exist uh, into an existing financial system that is uh, that she says is is, is inherently based on a different set of uh, uh, assumptions. Um, okay. Um, the financial sector uh, model itself is uh, flawed. Yes, I agree. Uh, at the basic uh, level, uh, uh, billions remain unbanked. Uh, financial literacy uh, remains low. Um, there's high intermediary costs. Uh, there's low trust in the financial system at best. And therefore, any, any proposals to green the financial sector needs to be based on evidence, uh, innovative, uh, innovative analysis. Melissa, can you hear us? I've lost uh, signal. I don't know if everybody can can hear Palessa or has she frozen? I wonder if you should just turn off your your screen. Palessa, have we lost you there? Palessa, do you want to turn off your screen? Okay, I don't know if people can indicate to me whether I'm the only one who has lost. Ah, okay. Palessa, do you want to, can you hear me? Do you want to take that question again? I think she's lost connection, Elizabeth. All right. So shall we then, let's see if she can uh, get back on. Let's see, let's move on to the, uh, let's move on to the uh, uh, two other questions. Um, uh, one was around how we can use FOCAC to maximize and to enhance uh, Africa trade. Um, I mean, it's made in the context of needing, uh, of saying that Africa needs to fully implement the Africa Tree, Tree Trade Agreement. So I don't know whether maybe a Lauren or a Basu or indeed a Kwame can, can, uh, can, can comment on that. And then the last question, uh, which related to the seeming fusion uh, of BRI with uh, the African continental free trade area, and where, did, where does that leave uh, FOCAC? Or is that a, um, a not a correct interpretation of, 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 of some of the narrative? Okay. Uh, Lauren, Kwame, uh, Weiwei, anybody want to take that? Those two questions? Okay, Lauren? well, this is Kwame, oh, can I respond? Okay. okay, yes. Yes, yes, absolutely, go, go ahead. Okay, um, uh, my, my, my view is that um, um, I think um, structural transformation is something that every African country, most African countries seek. Um, and, um, and I think it's because it's structural, I think it depends on what policy choices they take and where they send the incentives. Um, I think that what that means is that uh, the kind of reforms that are required in agriculture and the kind of reforms that are required as Weiwei's paper showed us that look, the government of Ethiopia chose to provide certain incentives and to provide certain policy uh, that then allows new investment in manufacturing uh, is the way to go. Um, whether you, you can actually make an external um, trade pact responsible, or let me say that trade instruments are just mechanisms for reaching structural transformation. They cannot be themselves the, that. And I think we shouldn't have too much hopes um, of trying to impose or insisting that China or a specific agreement provide that to us. Many, in many cases, most of those are actually reforms that are undertaken domestically and then how they translate into new opportunities for investment and new opportunities for, for, for transferring labor and resources away from agriculture into the manufacturing sector is a choice that needs to be made. So there's no shortcut for, for African countries. I think we, we have to do the, the heavy lifting. Yeah. 
Thanks. The hard, the hard slog. Um, uh, Lauren, do you want to take the BRI question? Um, sure. Yeah. I, I also just want to say I really liked the point I think Kwame made earlier on labor productivity because, I mean, this just this determines so much about where a foreign investor will go. So it's all very well to have the world's youngest population. It's all very well to have this burgeoning workforce. And the, the kind of ugly truth of factories in China in the 1980s and 90s was that, you know, in, in the period when maybe productivity was, was a challenge, maybe there were a lot of government incentives as well as just the kind of draw of the long run Chinese market. The allure of the Chinese market was a reason to invest in the long run. Um, but also the wage was just horribly low. So the, the, like these is the just the reality backdrop of, you know, like that this whole process of structural transformation and so on taking time. You know, it wasn't it wasn't a miracle in China that was a miracle of 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 great high wages and so on. It was kind of a long, hard road earned of the right incentives, the right allure and lower wages, like none of which I'm advocating. I'm just explaining the reality of how that, that happened in a Chinese context. And if, if it's not going to be the same as the Chinese context, fair enough, but then the incentives need to be targeted such that in, it, it makes sense for investors to invest in the long run, but on a different track. It might be that well, it makes sense to invest here because the resources are right next door, you know, whereas China had to import the resources. But maybe maybe there's some tiny benefit on the wage side of having the resources next door. So that just that will take away some costs otherwise or not, depending on the infrastructure. So I really just want to say I like that point of just getting the fundamentals right of, you know, having the right skilled labor, the right arrangements, the right incentives and then on the on the BRI after sense I think the thing is that there's this kind of a similar long run time frame China has this goal of being a frontier modern prosperous economy by and society by 2049 and as that's not that's just a decade and a bit behind the African 2063 agenda so I, I, I don't even think it's necessarily has been thought out in a mechanical sense, but just the, the kind of timing that from 2020 to 20, that's like three whole decades of just working together to get that partnership, you know, right over time so that Africa can work toward 2063 and China toward 2049. Um, how that works is obviously up to African countries and China to, to navigate, well, where is, BRI useful for an African country. And primarily, I mean, there's so much confusion around what even is the BRI. It's such an obtuse name. And it works in the Chinese language much more normally than it works in the English language. And you just kind of, if you see it as that umbrella, like it's really an umbrella, like where, where from 1979 to roughly the launch of the BRI, China was focused on opening and reform or actually literally reform and opening. So it was reform and opening, reform and opening. And that was a China-focused period. It was about modernizing China, increasing technology, labor productivity, and so on. Now, this period of Belt and Road is really the kind of outbound version of that. So it's getting Chinese investment right. It's getting China's currency more internationalized. It's internationalizing, not internationalizing Chinese services, and so on. So... It, it's as vague as was opening and reform. So, you know, even the fact that the word initiative is, is used is probably imperfect because it gives it a more tangible context than it actually has. It's just a really like a long run umbrella outbound version of what the inbound version of reform and opening was. So in your head, don't even use, just think of it as China's trade and investment. And, and as an economist, I sometimes get annoyed that it's turned into Belt and Road because it really is just trade investment and international economics. So don't be distracted. And that just goes back to the fundament of getting how can BRI work such that it feeds into those fundamentals? 
You know, it's really like, I mean, China kept its eye on its own development and I guess African countries need to do the same. And now they have this bigger smorgasbord of offerings for, for doing that but not, it might not work if they don't keep their eye on the ball as much as what China did over its own process. And just continually remember, think about what China did in 1980s and 90s, not what they are today. Like how did they get from 1980s, 90s to today? Because that's probably a better reference for, for African countries, but it's after. And I, also, I think it was Dr. Basso, or I can't remember who mentioned, he thinks Afri after will be a bit of a nightmare too. I completely agree with that. I mean, you have such different economies, such different arrangements. And, and just one other point coming back to China, also don't forget that China domestically is a bit of a nightmare. Like you have to think of China as a bit like the European Union with some quite poor frontiers in its west, some very, very rich urban, more coastal hubs. So you've kind of got like London as Shanghai, you know, and then like far west is much, much, you know, poorer regions. So in a way, Beijing is just a Brussels of a China free trade agreement, which is not even itself a free trade agreement. So just as, as another as another reference point, but I agree after has a, a long road, it's a good road, but it's a long road. Great. Thanks, Lauren. Of course, uh, the, the point about the Belt and Road being about uh, trade investment and international economics just doesn't have the same ring to it that a Belt and Road initiative does <laughs> from a but, branding perspective. <laughs> but it's just, it's like a Santa Claus sack. It can kind of be anything, but yeah. then that becomes as useful as distracting. So I do, you have to just cut through that. I'm, and I'm not saying that's not useful, but just keep your eye on the nitty gritty of, of the contracts and the trade and the investment. And this COVID context, one other point, I mean, in a way, this COVID thing about prioritizing local value change, one of the speakers said they agreed that they believe you still need foreign investment, you know, to upgrade the, the, the value chain in Africa, which I, I would instinctively agree with. Um, but the COVID context has kind of, in a way it's fast forwarded what BRI was trying to do anyway, which was outsource investment, which was facilitate, you know, trade and so on. So it's kind of a, an inversion of the, and a fast forwarding of the BRI agenda, which just makes it all the more important to keep one's eye on the ball. Like what, what is yeah. it, what is being offered? If it's not China, what is Europe now offering instead? And just to, to stay very, very focused, it's trade and investment. It's about the renminbi. You know, it's all these normal things just with a very unusual name, which is yeah. much more normal in Chinese than in English. Okay, great. Excellent. What I'd like to do is there is one more question posted in the Q&A, and I know we're a few minutes over. My watch tells me about five minutes over, but I'd like to maybe just give an opportunity to Wei Wei to, to, to respond to that question. I don't know if you can see, see it in the Q&A, uh, Wei Wei. It says, any figures in terms of results for, say, actual employment numbers as at now, rather than looking at 2025 targets, also linked to graduating from industrial development support to market export? How do you see the transition using the Ethiopia case in terms of access to the Chinese market for finished goods? Um, then there is another question there about, uh, for other speakers, what we can learn from other older trade partners with China in terms of African countries leveraging market access for Africans, Africans finished goods. I think uh, Lauren alluded to, to some of that in terms of looking at uh, examples of, of how both individual countries, but also potentially regional and, uh, or regional organizations actually engaged in it. I'll, I'll park that question because of time, but Wei Wei, I, I just want to come to you to see whether you have anything to, to add uh, in, in respect of this question. Wei Wei? Yes. Okay, you've, um, you've yeah, yeah, great, thanks. I'm sorry. Um, yes, I, but I don't have the exact figure with me, but according to my field work in 2018, for instance, the Hua Jinshu manufacturing is start production, uh, producing in 2012. And that time they only have around 2,500 local workers. And at the time I did uh, field work in 2018, they already increased uh, 7,500 
local workers, and the Chinese expertise remained similar around 200. That means that the training regarding the semi-skilled, unskilled labor is extensive, but the challenge really is about to how to um, how to develop and how to training local managers, technicians. This is a long-term goal. Uh, we, we're also looking on this to how to look at not only localization rate, but also to improve that value added in the global value chains. Um, this is of great importance. And it requires not only the Chinese investors, but also the local government, the host country government, the third party institutions such as GIZ or UNIDO to work together to set up this kind of tripartite cooperation at institutional level to enhance this kind of training in the coming future. And I also argue in my paper that uh, not only local workers, but also Chinese managers, those foreign expatriates are also important to be trained because they are the key people to transfer those knowledge and technology uh, knowledge and technology to those locals. And it is great importance they not only transfer this kind of ideas, but also um, provide mutual understanding regarding the culture, regulations, law. So this is important to have the further cooperation in the coming future. And um, let me see, sorry, the question. Um, and also, I will also argue that it, when Chinese firms invested in Ethiopia, their operation largely depend on the host country's political economic conditions and the social political pressure on the, on, uh, on the ground. Therefore, their response to the host country government regarding um, the employment job creation, technology transfer also um, is because of the pressure from the host country government regarding the industrial policy and what host country government expect them to do. Um, it is also important to, um, for the host country government to uh, take consider consideration, consideration that um, at the very beginning, they need to take into consideration the local worker, local community into the development planning at the very beginning. That is very important. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Weiwei. Um, I know that Basu had his hand up. Is there any, uh, was there a pressing issue uh, point you wanted to, to raise, Basu? Oh, no, uh, thanks, uh, moderator. No, actually that's a hang up from, I forgot to lower it from before. Oh, okay. Thanks. And I wasn't watching that and a colleague just pointed <laughs> it out to me, sorry. Um, sorry about uh, I that. See, I see Pelesa is back. Pelesa, I don't know what your connectivity is like. Do you want to finish very quickly answering the, the question to Sanusha? Or uh, are you happy with what you managed to get through? Uh, my apologies, my battery died. Um, oh. But I had, I, <laughs> I was done with my response. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Okay. Then uh, all that remains for me to say is please, you will have seen the link posted in the chat uh, function for the, for the evaluation uh, uh, form. It, it does take you literally less than a minute Please do, <clears throat> um, do fill it in uh, if you haven't already, um, or do it while I'm saying the final thank yous um, uh, before, we, before we close. Uh, I'd like to say a really, really big uh, thank you to my colleagues in the economic diplomacy team who have, uh, who have worked on putting together today's session and the ones to come uh, on the 15th. Uh, very big thank you to, <clears throat> to Cyril Prinsloo, uh, uh, <coughs> oh dear, <clears throat> to Cynthia Chiguenya and to Palissa uh, Shipalana, um, to our events team, uh, uh, Sarasa and Malay and Ndumi Munga, and and then of course to this really uh, stellar panel uh, and discussion that we've had uh, uh, this morning. Uh, really, it's been it's been really enriching uh, and. Uh, and really uh, uh, also providing some ideas about the way in which African governments need to think 
about the next few years and the kinds of policy frameworks that they uh, that they develop. Last but not least, let me of course uh, uh, thank. Uh, well, there's one more I have to thank from from the SIA team. Uh, let me thank also the comms team, uh, Nikki Rebok and Sapiu and Lamini, uh, for their support both in terms of uh, of some of the technical dimensions as well as the tweeting. Um, and then last uh, but not least, of course, our collaboration with the uh, Chinese embassy here in South Africa. Uh, uh, it's, been, it's been great. It's, it's, it's been uh, uh, very productive and we look forward to the next uh, two sessions uh, later this week. And of course, then uh, I realized that the ambassador had to leave, but our thanks to the ambassador also for kicking us off with a very rich uh, 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 presentation that that covered many of the of the topics that are, are very close to, to Africans' uh, hearts at the moment in the, in the context of COVID nineteen. So, with those few remarks, then um, have a good uh, afternoon. Uh, have a good lunch. We would ordinarily be serving lunch, but we can't do that now. Uh, but a really very big thank you to all of you for for participating, for some really useful comments in the chat box. Um, and hopefully uh, an enriching uh, discussion. We'll put all of these up on our website, both the PowerPoint presentations as well as the YouTube um, link as this was recorded and the evaluation form. Okay, great. So have a good afternoon. Ciao from me. Thank you.